And, and that's the title on the um, thumbnail for YouTube, but really I'm gonna be sharing with you Solomon's business model and how I've applied Solomon's business model, which God gave him to my business, and the results are unparalleled. Like, they're just unparalleled. And so I'm gonna show you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna go kinda fast today, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back next week and I'm gonna go into more detail because there's so much stuff that like, if I tried to cover it all in one week, we'd be here for six hours, right? There's that much stuff. So, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at Proverbs chapter. What's, what's really interesting is this. Um, when I started reading the Bible at 16 years of age, the conclusion that I realized, the, the, the awareness that came to me was this. If I, if I apply this Bible to my life, if I go to the Bible looking for something to do instead of looking for something to know, right? Instead of looking for something to recite, instead of looking for something to prove, if I go to the Bible look, as I'm, okay, I'm looking for orders from headquarters, perhaps my life will get better. And every, without exception, every aspect of my life that I applied the word of God to got exponentially better in a really short period of time. And so I ended up in business, which is what I do now. And in business, it just occurred to me one day, Solomon was the wisest, wealthiest man who ever lived. And, but he was also a wicked man. He wasn't wicked his whole life, but he was wicked for a part of his life. And see, a, a lot of people will conclude that Solomon was wicked because he was wealthy. But I submit to you that Solomon was wicked in spite of the fact that he was wealthy. Right? He wasn't weak. His wealth is not what made him wicked. His wealth is not even what led him astray. Right? It's not even what got him off the, the path. Because if, if it were, and you're, as we're going to see here, it's not even what he asked for, then God would have been responsible for his wickedness. Right? So, so, so I'm going to give a couple of, uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to give this whole idea that because you're a follower of God or you're a follower of Christ, that means you should be broke as a joke and ready to choke and drive a rattle trap car and look like, look like, you know, everything you have on is good because it came from goodwill, right? No, that, that idea is not a biblical idea. That is a pagan idea that got adopted from Greek mythology. I don't even have time to go into all the details. Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Roman Catholicism, and when the Protestants Protestant, it means Protestant. The Protestants came out of the Catholic Church. Almost every church, I don't, it doesn't matter what denomination it is. Almost every modern day church in churchianity has its roots in Protestantism, which means they came out of the Catholic Church. Well, here's the problem with that. When the Reformers came out of the Catholic Church, they came out of the Catholic Church because they realized that the Catholics were teaching a work salvation. You have to do something to be accepted by God, which is, by the way, what all religions teach. You have to do something to be accepted by God. That's why salvation is not a religion. It is a relationship with a person. It is not a religion. When, when I say religion, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about from the Latin root legere, which means to bind. And basically what religions do is one man or a group of men or men and women or people, individuals, attempt to get other people to abide by the rules that they establish based on something because it doesn't necessarily have to be. The first religion in the history of the world, we find in Genesis chapter 3, um, when it says, when Satan said to Adam and Eve, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What, is, what, what, what religion is that? It's hedonism. And what is it? Man replaces God. That's the first religion in the history of the world. Every other religion since then is a derivative of that. Okay? And, and I would even argue that Judaism is not a religion. Okay? It is a... It, it literally was designed to be a theocracy, which is a, a monarchy that was ruled by God. I don't even have time to go into all of the details of that right now because it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with what I'm saying, except for the fact that because Greek mythology, they are, in Greek mythology, they're a god of prosperity and they're a god of poverty, right? The god of prosperity was, was Mammon, right? You cannot serve God in Mammon, right? Okay, it was Mammon. And the, I don't remember what the god of poverty's name was, because they, like, you go to Greece, they still have gods for everything, these little idols for everything. Anyway, it's fascinating. But, um, but the, the Catholics also took on this whole, they, they were, they were poly, 
um, religious. They had all these religious and pagan beliefs that they adopted from all these different sources. But when the reformers came out of the Catholic Church, they did it because they realized that salvation was by grace through faith, and that even the faith was not of yourselves. It was the gift of God, not of works. So salvation was something that we received from God, not something we worked for, right? And so, but when they came out, they got salvation right, but they still had a whole lot of that other pagan slash Catholic slash religious gobbledygook mingled up in it. And so while they got salvation right, they got living wrong. And part of what they got living wrong was poverty is piety and wealth is wickedness. Okay? So anyway, just want y'all not to be confused. So here we go. We're going to talk about the wealth, the wisdom, and the wickedness of Solomon. Okay? So um, it says in 1 Kings chapter 3, um, 1 Kings chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 1 um, down to verse number mm, 14, okay? It says, and Solomon made an affinity. And I'm, I'm going to broad, really broad strokes, going to go kind of fast, and then we're going to come back and break down some of this stuff over the next couple of weeks. Okay, here we go. And Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David, until he had made an end of the building of his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. So the, the first thing that we see in Solomon's business model is the partnerships he procured were powerful. Solomon procured powerful partnerships before he had his encounter with God. Okay? So I want you to see that. He did this before. He, like, so, so you want to make sure that you do what Solomon said do in, in Proverbs chapter 3, I think it is, verse 6, where it says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So before you go into a partnership that's powerful, like seek guidance from God. Okay, more on that later. Okay, so only the people sacrificed in high places because there's no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high place. So the second thing we see that was really contributing to the wealth and the wisdom of Solomon, the first thing, the, the partnerships he procured were powerful, but I want you to see the passion he possessed was possessive. He loved the Lord, how? With all his heart. So his love, his passion for God consumed his life. And then it says, and, and he walked in the ways of David, his father. So we see also that the path that he patterned was paternal. What does that mean? He walked in the ways of David, his father. I'm going to tell you one of the biggest mistakes you can ever make in life and in business to attempt to lead your leaders and follow your followers. It's always a mistake. Warning to followers. When I say followers, I'm talking about children. Don't try to lead your parents. Warning. I'm talking about, I'm talking about employees. Don't try to lead your employer. Right? Why? Well, if we go read Romans chapter 13, let every soul be subject to the higher power. Now watch what it says next. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. It didn't say the powers that be are godly. It said they're ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. That means if somebody is in authority over you, you yield to them because they are working on God's behalf, whether they know it or not. He, he walked in the ways of David, his father. What you've got, in, 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 in parenting, a rebellious child is living a dangerous life. Why? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The scripture says, you want to live longer, listen to your parents. Wow. Paul said when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, the things that you have heard and the things that you have heard and seen in me do. Follow the leader. He said, he said, and I don't remember exactly where he said this, but he said, be ye followers of me as I am a follower of Christ. Basically, as long as I'm following Christ, it's okay to follow me. When I stop following Christ, stop following me. Y'all tracking? Okay. So then uh, the path that he patterned was paternal. See, one of the problems people have is they listen to people who know nothing, and they don't listen to people who know something. Right? Like, 
<laughs> it's so fascinating. Like, don't take advice from anyone on any subject unless you want to trade places with them in that area. You, you know another parent that has baby kids? Don't let them teach you how to parent your kids. Right? Somebody who's broke as a joke and ready to choke, you do not need to get financial advice from them. I don't care if it is your next door neighbor or your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law. You don't need to get financial advice from broke people. Okay, y'all track him. So he, the path he patterned was paternal. Um, and then it says, um, walking in the statue of David's father, only he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. And the king went to Gibeon there and sacrificed there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. A thousand. A thousand is like supreme. It's, it's, it's aloof, right? It's the same word that we would use for general. It's, it's based on the letter Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew Aleph bait. It's the letter that represents God. A thousand burnt offerings Solomon offered upon the altar. And so Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings. What's a burnt offering a picture of? A burnt offering is a picture of total sacrifice. When you burn the offering, you're saying, I'm not keeping any of this for myself. So Solomon, the price that Solomon paid was a premium. He said, I'm willing to sacrifice everything I am and everything I have in service to my king. That's what that is, a thousand burnt offerings. See, people want to have premium experiences, but they don't want to pay premium price. Solomon said, I'm, I'm willing to pay everything. Wow, ain't that fascinating. It's in the Bible. Right? A thousand burnt offerings did he offer upon the altar. Okay, well, when Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings, this is such a cool lesson, by the way. When Solomon earned a thousand burnt offerings um, upon the altar, it says in verse 5, the next verse, it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Hey, can you imagine? Can you imagine waking up in the middle of the night? Hey, hey, hey. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wait, 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 wait. This is the Lord. Lord, I got a blank check up here with your name on it. What do you want me to fill it out for? I'm going to give you anything you want. What do you want? And you know what we do? Well, I want one of these and two of those, three of these, four of those, one in blue, seven in green, right? And we want a pocket full of money. And all. Solomon didn't ask for any of that. The, it, it, God came to Solomon and said, ask what I shall give thee. But God didn't come to Solomon and tell him that until Solomon had already offered everything. See, people say, Myron, how do you know the will of God? The, the only way to know God's will for your life is to yield to it before you know what it is. You can't come to God with preconceived notions and agendas. He's not interested. God's not interested in, in God is not Monty Hall. Some of y'all are like, Monty Hall, who's that? He's not, let's make a deal. Some of y'all are like, so like, who's Monty Hall? <laughs> I, I never heard of it. Okay. God's not, let's make a deal. God seeks people who are seeking for him. And Solomon was a thousand burnt offerings. I, everything I have is already yours. So what am I going to do? Try to hold, keep from you what's already yours? So what happens next? Well, God said, ask what I shall give thee. Now, I want you to notice the prayer of Solomon. The prayer that Solomon played, prayed was purposeful. I want you to notice this prayer. It's mind-blowingly purposeful. This, this, is, this is not the great, but this is one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. This is, one of the, this is one of the most important things any of us will ever pray. Notice what it says. I'm going to read it first. It says, um, and Solomon said, God said, ask what I should give thee. And Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness of heart righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. I want you to notice something. Does that not strike you as odd, reading that? Does it strike anybody else as odd, or is it just me? What about y'all on YouTube? Does it strike you as odd? It strikes me as a little odd. Who is Solomon? Solomon is the son of David. David and who? Because you know David can't have a baby by himself. So David and who? Oh, that's right, David and Bathsheba. Who's Bathsheba? Bathsheba is Uriah's wife, who David had killed, so he could take her after he committed adultery with her. But even though Solomon is the son of the Gentile bride, who, by the way, was born from a mother that David had an illegitimate relationship with before 
he was born, and his older brother died as an infant as a result of David's sin. But he said, you've shown my father David this great kindness as he walked before you in righteousness and uprightness of heart. Like, what David are you talking about, Solomon? He's talking about the David that was his father. God does not put us on this earth to execute judgment on those who he has put over us. Even the, even the, even the Hebrew children, even the Hebrew children, when, they, when the king wanted them to eat um, meat offered to idols and drink the king's wine, they didn't say, I, I don't know who you think you're dealing with. Don't you know I'm a child of God? I don't know. They didn't do that. They, 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 they asked for permission, for an exception, for God to prove who he was. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't rise up in pride and arrogancy like modern day churchianity folk do. No, they didn't do that. They yielded to the will of the king. Anyway, so, anyway, um, so, uprightness of heart with thee, and has kept for him this great kindness, given his son to sit his, and now Solomon's about to start asking. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child, I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people. He didn't say, I'm in the midst of my people. He said, I'm in the midst of thy people. Which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant understanding, an understanding heart um, to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great people? So I'm going to put that prayer in modern day vernacular, but I wanna ask y'all a question first. For those of you on YouTube, have you ever had an assignment that you felt like was so much bigger than you, you couldn't handle it? Anybody in here ever had an assignment that felt like it was so, like, how about all of them, <laughs> like, right, right? <laughs> you get married, you're like, I don't know how to be a husband. I, I've never, I, I don't know how to be a wife. What am, I, what am I doing, right? And so what happened is Solomon said, you gave me a job to do that's bigger than me. I don't know how to do it. So I'm going to ask you to give me a wise and understanding heart so that I can do the thing you put me here to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. So here's the prayer. Here's the prayer that I pray over my life. Dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you've given me to serve. See, I, I ain't trying to impress nobody. Right? Because it's a waste of time. And if you do impress somebody, it won't last. And it's probably not real anyway, because they're, they're impressed with the plastic avatar of you. Right? <laughs> not the real live version. Can I get a witness? Right? And so, so he said, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. What, how would the world change if every parent prayed the prayer, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to parent these children in a way that pleases you and serves these children that you've given me to serve? What if every husband prayed, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to serve, to give me the wisdom to do, to tr treat this wife the way you intended for me to treat her in a way, help me to be the husband, the kind of husband you desire me to be in a way that pleases you and serves this wife you've given me to serve. For the ladies to pray, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to be the kind of wife you put me here to be in a way that pleases you and serves this husband you've given me to serve. What if every national ruler prayed the Lord, same prayer Solomon prayed over his kingdom. Dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the job you put me here to do in this government in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. What if every business owner in the world, everybody woke up one morning and realized that please myself and find people to serve me. How would that shift the entire attitude of the entire planet? People talk about saving the planet. This will, this will change everything. This will save marriages. This will save relationships between parents and children. It'll make businesses flourish. It'll make governments thrive. But everybody is, is reaching and vying. See, there are two kingdoms. When you understand there are two kingdoms, and the, in these two kingdoms, it's, it's so interesting. The Bible is not a book about religion. The Bible is a book about a king, a kingdom, a royal family. 
and the culturalization of a foreign land called earth. The, the reason human beings are on earth, God put man on earth to ex, ex, establish and expand the heavenly kingdom to the planet earth. To take the, to take the spiritual principles from the kingdom realm, from the, from the heavenly kingdom realm, and then integrate them into the earthly realm. See, that's why the scripture says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. What does that mean? The kingdom of God is not physical. What is more necessary to physicality than eating and drinking? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what is it? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, right? So when we think of righteousness, we think of doing good deeds, but it's more than that. We think of righteousness. Righteousness is when God rules over my example, so I am not doing the right thing because if I don't do the right thing, Darren might see me doing the wrong thing. I'm doing the right thing because I, I'm in Romans chapter 7. Righteousness is when God rules over my example. What is peace? Peace is when God rules over my experience. So now I don't get rattled when, 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 Satan start, when the toothless lion starts roaring. Mm, I wish I had some heaven. Okay, right? And what's joy in the Holy Ghost? Joy in the Holy Ghost, by the way, is perpetual joy. One of the things as a follower of Christ, if you have, if you have received Christ as your Savior, one of the signs of that, this is in the Bible. I didn't put it in there, y'all. One of the signs of that is we are to live in a state of perpetual joyfulness. Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And again, I say rejoice. That's a whole lot of rejoicing. We're supposed to live in a state of perpetual joyfulness. Why? Well, it tells us in the next verse. Let your moderation, your self-control be known unto all men. Why? For the Lord is at hand. Well, what does that have to do with joyfulness? Well, in his presence is fullness of joy. So when a person is the only way for a human being to live in a state of perpetual joyfulness is to be perpetually aware of the fact that the Lord is at hand. If I'm aware of the fact that I'm in his presence, it doesn't matter what's in my presence. Am I telling y'all the truth? And so, and so it doesn't matter if the giant rages, if I'm more aware of the presence of the Lord than I am the giant. The problem that Saul and the other children of Israel had when Goliath was breathing out threatenings for 40 days and 40 nights, the problem was they were more aware of the giant than they were of the God who made the giant. David came along. David, David heard, he knew Goliath couldn't win. Do you, do you see how powerful this is? This is, this is so mountain-movingly powerful. And so, so um, oh, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost, what's that? Righteousness is when God rules over your example. Peace is when God rules over your experience. Joy in the Holy Ghost is when God rules over your expression. Because what does the Holy Ghost do? So the scripture says God gives us his spirit, and what does it do? It wells up in us like a well, spring of living water. This is, this is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So he, he said, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you, serves the people you've put me here to serve. When we understand, when we understand that I am not here, it's, it's so interesting how this matches up. It gives me chills in fact when I think about it. Remember what, remember what happened in um, Deuteronomy chapter 17? Y'all remember what happened in Deuteronomy <laughs> Do I remember what happened in Deuteronomy <laughs> that's, that's kind of a goofy question. Okay. But I'm kind of a goofy fellow, so y'all pray for me. Don't judge me. Okay. So, in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter, um, buh, 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 buh. yeah, chapter 17, verse 14, it says, When thou art come unto the land, the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt possess it, and dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are about me. So God's telling him, look, when you get in the land that I'm going to give you, you're going to ask me for a king so you can be like everybody else. So what do we learn from that? It's dangerous trying to do what everybody else does. Right? Right? I get it. You want to model success, but don't try to be somebody else. Because if you do, nobody's there. Right? That's what Kenny Grant said. Nobody's there. Okay. So because the person you're trying to be ain't there and you ain't there, so nobody's there. Okay. So, so he said... Um, he said, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. I'm going to let you set a king over you, but I'm going to pick the king. Y'all track him? And then he said, 
He said, uh, I lost my place. Uh, one, yeah, which I shall choose, verse 15. One from among thy brethren, thou shalt set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses unto himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. In other words, horses came from Egypt. Your power does not, some trust in chariots, some in horses, we shall what? Remember the name of the Lord our God. That's what that's talking about. Don't go back to Egypt thinking your power is there. Remember what I told you all at the beginning of this? Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and brought his daughter to the city of David. Oh, he had already messed up. But even though he'd already messed up, he's, 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 getting, he's, getting, back to, he's getting back to, his, his, to the truth, right? He had already messed up, though. Well, watch what it says. It says, um, multiply, for as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall ye multiply wives to, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. That's where Solomon messed up. Solomon messed up by making an affinity with an evil king, by thinking his power was coming from somebody else other than God. Don't forget, it's the Lord that gives you the power to get wealth. You don't have to do deals with evil people to create wealth. You don't have to form alliances with people because you think they can help you get ahead. Promotion doesn't come from the East and it don't come from the West, it comes from the Lord. People say, well, Myron, do you wanna do a promotion with this person? And, and, and I'll go look at their Instagram pro profile. I don't match my brand. I ain't doing it with promotion with that person. What would I look like? N no. Okay, y'all tracking. Um, thou shalt in any wise uh, blah, 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 multiply horses. Uh, neither shall he multiply wives, 17, unto himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. I want you to notice a key word in these verses. Himself! It ain't about you. It ain't about me. This business that I'm, the Lord has put me over, it ain't about me. I am not confused. God, ain't, God didn't put me here to make my name great. He put me here to make his name great. Oh, snap. And then it says, and it shall be, I love this part. This is my favorite part. It shall be with him. I'm sorry. No, verse 18. And he shall uh, be, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write a copy of this law in a book out of, out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and keep all the words of his law and these statutes to do them that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right nor to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. What was the king's job? Study the word of God so you can execute judgment. Say what? Hey, how about this for a business plan? Study the Bible, write some verses down every day and read them. Now, I know that sounds funny. That's a, like, that's a, that's a business. Y'all, if you, like, it, it's interesting to me how the Bible was written over a period of thousands of years, 40 different human authors, and every reference re, reconfirms the other references. It's mind blowing. Y'all remember what it says in Joshua chapter one, instead of live, celebrating people who live real lives. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's insanical. That's the combination of insanity and maniacal when you get together and it's insanical. Okay, so, so, so it, it, it's, it's mind blowing. It says, this will law shall not depart from out of thy mouth. Talk about the word of God. Here's, how's this for a success form? Talk about the word of God. Thou shalt meditate there in day and night. Think about the word of God. Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Take action on the word of God. If we will talk about the word, think about the word, take action on the word, here's what the scripture says. This book of the law shall not depart out of the mouth. Thou shalt meditate there in day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then, what does that mean? After you do those things, when you, when you meet the prerequisites, now this comes next. After you meet the requirements, here's what you can expect. Then shall he 
make his way prosperous. God didn't say that I'm going to make his way prosperous. You know why? Because God doesn't give you the wealth. He gives you the power to get the wealth. Then shall he make his way prosperous, and then he shall have good success. It's in the Bible. I know people don't like it because it doesn't fit in with their religious dogma about being broke and, and poverty being piety and wealth being wickedness. By the way, wealth is not righteousness either. But the scripture does say that wealth, durable riches, and righteousness are the result of wisdom. Now, if God wants us to be broke, he wouldn't tell, and he wants us to be, if God wants us to be broke, he'd want us to be lazy, stupid, gluttonous drunks. Because those are the outcomes of being lazy, stupid, gluttonous, and drunken. Poverty. The drunkard and the glutton shall lie down together and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. Like all we, we don't, we, we, like we don't have to know Greek or Hebrew. All we have to do is read a little slower and think about it. Well, back to King Solomon. Dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you um, and serves the people you put me here to serve. So I'm going to go to my, uh, I'm really hot. <laughs> and I know it's probably not as hot in here as I am. Whoo, Hallelujah. <laughs> Okay, so, so what's interesting is back in 1 Kings chapter 3, Dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. That should be our heart's desire every waking moment of our lives. When I come in contact with a, per, with a, with a person, I should be seeking ways to serve them. Are y'all tracking? Like, like, you, do you understand that every word is a seed, every thought is a seed, every deed is a seed that I'm sowing into the garden of my future? And people go around sowing bad seeds and looking for a good harvest. That ain't the kind of seeds you sowed. Okay, y'all tracking. So, then, um, it says in verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord, that Solomon asked this thing. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and has not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast thou asked for the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to your words. I've given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee, like thee before thee, and neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches. Wait, God is pleased with this man's prayer, he said, I'm going to give you something you didn't even ask me for. So if riches are bad, then God must be bad for giving Solomon riches. It's in the Bible. I didn't put it in there. Right? Why is God going to give somebody something bad for doing something good? It, it's, it's insanical. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. So I'm going to give thee what thou hast not asked. Mm, I lost my place. Peace, peace be the Lord, and according to thy word. Given thee a wise and understanding heart. Um, I've given thee a wise, verse 12, and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. I am going to make you the best of the best. You can forget about the rest. God said, because you ask for something to please me and serve people, instead of asking for something for yourself, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you so good at what you do, you have no competition. What? It's in the, is it, it, how do they say, it's in the Bible. <laughs> right? Wait a minute. And then he says, um, I've given thee which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so there shall not be any among thee like unto the kings all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. And Solomon woke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pe and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant and the Lord, uh, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast unto all servants. Now, okay, this is this is God giving Solomon wisdom. So we see we see the the partnerships he procured were powerful. We see the path that he uh, the pos the pos oh, the passion he possessed was possessive. It possessed him. He loved God so much that it just owned him. The path that he patterned was paternal. The price that he paid was a premium, but the prayer that he prayed was purposeful. What was the purpose? He understood the purpose, not just of his life, but of human life. Please God, serve people. That's the purpose of life. Why? Because God created us in his image. Well, 
What's the first thing God tells us about God? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. First thing God tells us about God is he's creative, which means he created me to create stuff. He created us to create stuff, and he made us to make stuff. So we cannot feel, we cannot feel fulfilled. Like, you can have money and still be unfulfilled. So how to be fulfilled. Hmm. We need three things. We need creation. We need to create things. We need to create things that make other people's lives better. We need to create things that make our lives better. See, the extreme leftist regime people who worship the planet instead of the creator, they would have us to believe that when human beings create stuff, we use our resourcefulness to create resources for ourselves that was for you. When I fly over this New York City, or I fly over Chicago, or I fly over Atlanta, or Los Angeles, I am blown away by the organic nature of those cities. That's not, that's not organic, that's man-made. So how is it that when an eagle uses its resourcefulness to make an eagle's nest, that's organic? When an ant uses its resourcefulness to make an ant hill, that's organic. When a beaver uses its resourcefulness to make a beaver dam to make its life better, that's organic. But when human beings use the resourcefulness that God put in us to make our lives better, we're destroying the planet. Anyway, we have to create things. And we, we can't save the planet anyway. We, we, the, the scripture does say, pollute not the land in which you would dwell. We should not be pollutants. We should not, we should not be intended. But, but understand from creation, from, from life, life the by, in a sinful world, the byproduct of life is death. What do you mean? Well, even when we eat. Like, we, like, if I eat an apple, the apple's alive till I eat it. When I get done, it ain't, it ain't alive no more. I done killed it. <laughs> right? Same thing. And, and animals, you have to kill them before you eat them. For those you eat animals, you shouldn't kill animals. Whatever. Like, I, I'm, that's not the conversation I'm having. I'm just saying our, our body, when we breathe in, that oxygen keeps me alive. But when I breathe it out, I better not be sleeping with a plastic bag over my head because it will asphyxiate me. It will not suffocate me. It will asphyxiate me. I will die from the gases that I'm breathing in because they were contaminated by the sinful flesh. Okay. I, anyway, so we have to create. We want to be fulfilled. We have to create. We need creation. I didn't mean to write create. I meant to write creation. But y'all got me talking so fast. Y- y'all don't have me talking fast. I, the reason I talk fast is because my brain thinks fast and I don't want to lose my place. I get it. I know some of you on YouTube, it really irritates you that I talk so fast. I get it. So there's a button at the top of your screen. You can slow down the YouTube video for you, for those. Like even when I watch YouTube videos, I watch them all two times speed. I can't I can listen to ebooks two times speed. This is how my brain works. So this is a judgment free zone, y'all. Okay, so creation. You need creation, but creation but alone, it can make you wealthy, but it cannot make you fulfilled. This is why rich people are miserable. This is why there are rich people that are miserable. All rich people are not miserable. I know I is one and I is not miserable. Okay, why? Because I don't just have creation. I also have connection. God had creation before he created man. What's the last thing God created? God created man. Why? Because God was not connected to the animals. He was not connected to the trees. He couldn't have conversations with the trees and the animals. And then they have a conversation and think and then decide and choose and live and breathe and have make this. They can't do that, but we can. So God created something in his image so he'd have someone to connect with other than himself. Are y'all tracking? What would happen? Man sinned. And when man sinned, he alienated, he broke the connection. And so what did God do? He gave us the last piece, and that is contribution. God made a sacrifice so that man could be reconnected with God. The ultimate sacrifice was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that contribution, by the way, the name of God, the name of God that we say Yahweh, but it's actually yud heh vav heh, the Hebrew name for God, yud heh vav heh. This is God's name. When, when Jewish people like, come to this name, they just say Hashem. Hashem means the name. They don't say the name. They just say Hashem, right? Well, yud heh vav heh. Yud is a hand. Hey, behold. Vav is a hook or a nail. Hey, behold. Hmm, the name of God, really? The hand behold, the nail behold? Behold the nail, behold the hand? 
contribution. What's the contribution? The contribution is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The contribution, the contribution is the, the substitute sacrifice that God had Abraham go get a, a ram three years old, Genesis chapter 15, a ram three years old, a she-goat three years old, um, a heifer three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon, and he killed those animals and cut them in pieces, but don't cut up the birds. And he put, put them in some piles. And then God got ready to enter into a covenant with Abram, but he couldn't, Abram couldn't do it. So he put Abram to sleep and Abram had to have a substitute. And what was the substitute? It came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace, that's a p- type of God the Father, and a burning lamp, that's a type of God the Son, passed between those pieces. And the, the, the burning lamp was taking the place of Abram. Because if Abram had walked that covenant with God, one, he couldn't keep the covenant, so he would have had to die. Two, he would have been face to face with God, he would have had to die. So what happened? Man had to have a substitute. What was the substitute? God's contribution. That's why the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, many will say unto me in that day, um, um, uh, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And here's what the scripture says. And then will I say unto them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Watch this. I never knew you. Why? Because there's no no good thing I can do to be accepted by God. I can only be accepted by God by trusting in his contribution. Are y'all tracking? Okay, so so Solomon had, he had the, he he prayed and asked God, I want to please you and I want to serve people. So think about it. Please you. I'm going to, what am I going to do to please God? I'm going to create stuff. I'm going to create stuff to make other people's lives better. I'm going to connect with people. And then I'm going to be, I'm going to be a giver, not a taker. Anyway, now, don't remind me. I got to get to the next chapter. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, so let me say this. I'm going to say this in broad strokes because I, I think next week, next week, we're going to look at Solomon again. We're still going to be looking at the, uh, the, the wealth, wisdom, and uh, wickedness of Solomon. But let me, let me give you a breakdown first. So, I'm, so the story that we just read was at the beginning of, of Solomon's assignment, right? And at the beginning of Solomon's assignment, he was fully yielded to the Lord. In the, middle, in the beginning of his life, he was just fully yielded to the Lord and wanted with every fiber of his being to please God. I believe that as David is a type of Christ, I believe that Solomon is a type of the church. I can't prove it, but I believe it is for a lot of reasons. But anyway, so and when I say the church, I'm not talking about the building because the building is not the church. Okay. Like somebody says to me, where do you go to church? I said, when you, I, if you'll answer this question for me, then I'll answer that question for you. Where in the Bible does it say go to church? It tells us to be the church, not to go to church. Church is not a place you go. Church is an organism you are a part of or not a part of. It's a body that you're a part of or not a part of. Anyway, another conversation for a different day. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to church, but I think but by putting emphasis on that, we're emphasizing the wrong thing because we've got a lot of folks going to church who ain't part of the church. Anyway. Um, I digressed. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that sometimes. In the middle of his life, what happened was Solomon started living in the blessing of a yielded life. And he forgot the blessing was from the yielding. And so what did he do? He did the same thing we do. We forget where it comes from and we stop yielding. We start thinking that the blessing that is on us is because of us. What did he do? He started doing the exact things God told him not to do, multiplying horses to himself, marrying heathen women, who the Bible tells us clearly turned his heart from God. It wasn't his wealth that turned him from God. It was the wicked women that he married. It was his fleshly appetites that turned him away from God. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So at the beginning of his life, he was yielded. In the middle of his life, he was like whacked out of his mind, like doing all kinds of craziness. He had 700, he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Why? That's a thousand women. He shall not multiply wives unto himself. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Solomon, go read Deuteronomy chapter 17, bro. Okay, but guess what happened at the end of his life? He came to his senses. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And the book of Ecclesiastes, the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes is this, when you're reading it. It says life under the sun because it was translated by Catholics who worship the sun. It wasn't trans, like the, but in, in its original, it doesn't say life, every time it says life under the sun, in, in the, it's really talking about life under heaven. 
not life under the sun. Anyway, so um, here's the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. If you live your life for pleasing your life while you're living under, the, under heaven, you've wasted your life. If you live your life yielding to the t- temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, you've wasted your life. If you live your life yielding to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you've wasted your life. By the way, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is the same as the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. What is the, what is the temptation of the world? The temptation of the world is my desire to be somebody. I want people to think I'm important. That's a worldly temptation. The desires of the flesh. So, so, so the world tempts us in our ambitions when we need people to think something about us, when we need people to believe something about us because we gotta make this deal, we gotta make this happen, or we need, that's the temptation of the world. The temptation of the flesh is my desire, it tempts us in our appetites. It's my desire to feel something. And the devil tempts us in our attitudes. That's our desire to think something that goes against what God's word says is truth. Solomon was yielded. Now, we're going to see next week because we don't have time to see this week because <laughs> I've, got, I've got a challenge starting in um, 12 minutes. We're going to see next week, we're going to look at the promotions that Solomon produced, and they were prolific. It's mind-blowing. Like, God gave Solomon wisdom now. Solomon didn't conjure this up in his mind. I am telling you, I believe with every fiber of my being, if we will yield our lives to God and pray and seek uh, in every, all our ways acknowledge him, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you, serves the people you put me here to serve. If we will live our lives like that, God will give us uncommon wisdom in uncommon times. Supernatural wisdom in a natural world will make you the best of the best. You can forget about the rest. And anybody who thinks they're your competition is delusional. With that in mind, I, like, go study the Bible. Go read it. It's mind-blowingly powerful. And when you read it, don't look for something to know. Don't look for something to prove. Look for something to do. Look for orders from headquarters. What am I supposed to do next? In the meantime, in between time, appreciate y'all on YouTube. Make sure you share the video, comment on the video, like it. And um, we'll look forward to seeing y'all next Wednesday, by the grace of God. Peace out, Cub Scouts.